Hello, everyone. Hello again. This is another one of my videos on my own lab work. And when it came back this time, oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Garrett Smith, the nutrition detective around these YouTube parts. And yeah, we're going to be going over my recent blood work. It was meant to be a six month update on the last ones I did. It ended up being, I, I didn't look at the exact numbers, maybe eight months instead. I don't know if it was nine, doesn't really matter. Yes. Sometimes even the doctor doesn't do his labs on time. Um, so anyway, I did a lot of labs, a lot, and I'm feeling really good right now. Better shape than I was in college, working out more than I did in college, feeling great, not on a single medication, not on any testosterone replacement therapy, like so many of those other biohacking health gurus out there. If your gurus on hormones, they don't biohack crap. If the diet they choose, if you tend to notice that a lot of the big names in the field are on hormones, their diet doesn't work. You can't say it's like a ancestral paleo, whatever cavemen, this is the way we always ate and your testosterone's low and you go, well, why is men's testosterone so low these days? There must be something else. And probably these guys had higher testosterone before they did their diet that ruined it. So I had been feeling before I get into these labs, I had been feeling amazing, like telling my friends, I was saying, since I've been doing some of these things that I've been doing, and some of these things I've been doing changed my labs in a way that those who are, look very short term, maybe like, ooh, that went the wrong way. I don't know if he knows what he's talking about. I know what I'm doing, and I know how to watch these labs. And I've been sitting there telling my buddies, my physique at times is changing in, in the mirror like day to day. And I... As you'll see, I have done testosterone replacement therapy before. I was on a very relatively low dose of like 150 milligrams a week. Most guys are on 200. So I was on lower than the average. I think I did it for about six months, maybe. Maybe a little longer. And I honestly felt like in my workouts today that I felt like I did when I was on testosterone. And I was going, this is really weird. And I didn't have tests to verify it. But now I do. The smile gives it away, doesn't it? So let me share my screen here and we'll go through the labs. There we go. All right. So if I had labs, so if I, if I have the double little, little double um, hyphen here, that just means there's no lab for that date. Um, this is, these are the recent labs, this column, May, 2022 last month, it's now June 11th. So if I had labs that were pertinent from the past, they're here and they go in chronological order. If something is in the range, either the standard range, or if I have very specific tighter ranges that are very much out of the ordinary, I'll have that range there. We'll go over like the ranges for the bile acids here. And the orange is out of range, whether it's high or low. Okay. So since we were talking about testosterone at the start, and since I, you should know, I am a 46 year old man. I have two kids. I have a small business. I have plenty of um, responsibilities. Most guys out there are, are not doing so hot on their testosterone, no matter how hard they try. And when you see the recent stuff, if you're not already looking at it, you'll see that whatever I figured out about nutrition and toxicity and correcting deficiencies might actually be working. Okay. So testosterone section first. So before I did testosterone replacement therapy in the past, so this is 2012, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, my total testosterone was 653. My free testosterone, which is the, uh, the, the amount that the, the, if you want to think of it, that's the, the real uh, nitro boost testosterone part, the stuff that is actually doing something, 14.8. Now it's 
you can see the range is over here. Estradiol at 28. Now I'm trying to remember back from when I did testosterone replacement therapy. I think they were saying like optimal estrogen was somewhere around 23. If I recall correctly, 24, 25, I don't remember exactly. I got out of that game because I didn't want to give guys drugs when I knew that it wasn't the root cause. So anyway, so mo uh, some, some of you would be looking at this going, wow, when you were 34, this is not bad. It's not, it's <laughs> the sad thing is, is this is not good. It, it, you could say it's good for relatively for today. Yes. Because you see, a, I have a lot of guys come to me. I, one of my videos here on YouTube, we brought a guy up from 250 to 500. 250 is really not good. And to naturally bring some up to 500, bring him up to 500, that, that was good. So that was kind of proof of concept right there that we could do this. But anyway, so this was it. So some, some guys are out there going, man, I'm jealous of his, his testosterone 12 years ago. And yeah, some of you guys in the 200s, 300s, 400s, and you're younger than me, you got stuff going on. You want to fix it. Doesn't mean go out and take testosterone. It might mean you do the, some of the stuff I'm telling you to do. So anyway, that was pre-testosterone replacement therapy. This was not great. It's not, it's okay. It's okay. It's not. Anyway, when I started taking testosterone replacement therapy, and I was doing a little bit of HCG with it, along with, you know, I was doing the injectable. Um, what do I want to say it was? It was, it was propionate, I believe. I don't even care anymore. Um, I was good at it. I sent one of my clients, one of my patients to another doctor. Cause when I quit, I was like, you got to go see somebody else. The other doctor didn't change a single thing I'd been doing. He was like, your numbers are great. I took that as a great compliment. And I said, okay, good. I, I know I know how to do this now. I don't want to do it anymore. Anyway. So on testosterone overshot a little bit, right? 1291 for total tests. I was outside of the range. Here's the range. Not saying that's a great range. We'll go over ranges in just a second. Free testosterone, 26.4, estradiol, estrogen, too high. And this is common to see when you push testosterone too high, you have overspill into too much estrogen. This is normal. I was trying to do this without having to take a bunch of anti-estrogens. I didn't want to take, for those of you out there who are taking like testosterone, and then you're getting into taking a bunch of anti-estrogens, more meds more supplements, more all of these things so that you're just playing the good old game of whack-a-mole, the good old game of pharmaceutical whack-a-mole. You take this drug, it causes this side effect. You take this drug for this side effect, and then you're going to get this side effect. And then you got to take this drug for this side effect. And all of those drugs, if you don't understand the liver, hormones, natural or synthetic, are like the, the most complex and difficult things your liver has to process. So let's just say maybe your low testosterone is because you're toxic and your liver can't handle its daily burden anyway. And then you're going to go because you want better woodies and better libido and more drive and more, you know, all that stuff. You're going to go and load your liver up with more hormones. Anti-aging doctors have a real nasty habit of dying quite early. You should, you should look into that. They really do. They may have amazing blood test numbers, maybe, but then they croak early. Proof's in the pudding, right? So here's me now. No testosterone replacement therapy. 893 and a half. I'm just going to say 900, so I don't have to re repeat 893 and a half every time. So basically a testosterone of 900. I was very pleasantly surprised to see this. And like I said, before I was, before I got these tests, I was feeling in the gym, like, I was like, I feel like I'm on testosterone. It's really a cool feeling. So I want to help other men reach this and other women have good hormones too, because some of y'all, y'all are getting there and, uh, who were working with me and it's, it's really cool. Free testosterone. I know somebody out there is going to be like, oh, your free testosterone is not high enough. I'm going to tell you from my function and everything that's going on, not worried about it. 
estradiol, if you remember, I said optimal estrogen was around, you know, what I, re what I recall being around 23 or 24, I think. Well, I'm right there. Gosh, and you want to know some estrogenic things I don't do in my diet? Copper and vitamin A. Did you know those were estrogenic and anti-testosterone? Isn't this kind of weird proof of concept that all the uh, hyper wannabe masculine guys out there, often in the diet world, the carnivores and the ketoers and the wapfers they're, and uh, the protocolers, they're all saying that you need, you need vitamin A to make testosterone. They say that you need vitamin A to make testosterone. I have been reducing or minimizing vitamin A in my diet for almost four years now. You cannot tell me that I need a certain amount of testosterone or a certain amount of vitamin A to make testosterone at all. You just can't even make that argument anymore. I will put these numbers up against any natural person who is not on testosterone and who advocates vitamin A and copper. Absolutely. I don't take any B vitamins either. I don't eat liver. I don't eat egg yolks. I don't eat dairy. I don't do any of that garbage. So anyway, so I wanted to put the testosterone at the start because anybody who's going to try to attack my labs later, you know, the ones down the list, well, you can always come back to this as proof of things working. Now, I want to say if somebody says, well, you might be on testosterone, Dr. Smith, you might be injecting in the, in the back room and stuff. First of all, I could do that. I'm, I'm a physician. I can write myself a script. I'm not here to blow smoke up any, anybody's ass. I will, if somebody wanted to pay for me to get an epi testosterone to testosterone, or I forget if it's testosterone to epi testosterone, that test where the, it's kind of a general test to show that you're on exogenous external hormones, testosterone specifically, I will take that test. I'm not paying for it. You can pay for it. I'll even give you my doctor's price. You can pay for it. I'll run it. It's a waste of money. You're not going to find anything. I'm just not paying for it because <laughs> if there's one thing I am, it's painfully honest. So I'm the one here going over all these labs. Go ask your guru to show their labs in detail. Okay. So now let's go into some more proof of concept. So those of you who have watched my live streams know that I talk about subclinical cholestasis, toxic bile in the blood, liver injury, bile, your, the most toxic fluid in your body, which is bile leaking into your blood. And that is the cause of your chronic disease, low testosterone, high estrogen, all your other problems, all your chronic disease, in my opinion, just about is due to toxic bile in the blood. So if my approach was specifically intended to seal up the bile pathway so that we had less bile leaking into the blood, and in theory, we should then see health improvements based on that, we should be able to see it in the serum bile acids, the bile acids in the blood. We can measure it, right? Now, before you get confused, I'm not going to say that, that bile acids by themselves, we're only measuring like six here. There's, I think, I believe I've seen in the research that there's up to 55 different bile acids in the blood. So looking at six of them doesn't tell you the other 49, which could be high, a crazy high, you know, we may not see one of them. I mean, we, we expect not to see it, right? So these are the ones that I can do through LabCorp. This is what I'm limited to. So don't say I'm trying to hide something. This is, this is everything. I'm not going to do urine bile acids. That just wasn't necessary. So we did serum because that's, that's where they cause you the problems. Sure. Bile acids in your bladder could cause you problems. Bile acids in your kidneys absolutely destroy your kidneys. That's why they're supposed to go through the liver to the bile, to the poop. That's the best way. So anyway, let's go over these bile acids. So serum bile acids, this is glyco and toro keno deoxycholic acids. And these are a primary bile acid. They're not considered to be as bad as the secondary bile acids. Okay. Six, what is this? Six months ago. Oh, it was, oh, it was no, it's uh, seven months ago, seven months ago, seven months ago, 1.9. 
Oh, May 2022, 1.1. Down by somewhere between a third and a half. Well, that's pretty good. Hmm. Let's keep going. Fractionated bile acids. So this is just a group of bile acids they test. Oh, four of them. They test four of them, and then they give you a total of those. I want, so what, what you're looking at here is I want all of these zero. I believe that optimal health comes about when you have zero nada, zip, zilch, bile acids in your blood. That's what I want. Now, these ranges right here next to it, see that less than 10, less than 1.9, less than 2.2. These are the ranges that the lab gives as the normal range. Okay. Under these numbers is what's considered normal, less than. Okay. I want zero. So I put the zeros here and then they, these are the normal lab numbers. Okay. Urso deoxycholic acids, UDCA. This is something that they give people as a pharmaceutical. You may have heard of UDCA. You may have heard of TUDCA. Those are both secondary bile acids. Both are not good for you. You can take them and reduce your symptoms. You can be tired and drink coffee. That doesn't mean you fixed a damn thing. So I've been good both times. Lower than the lab could measure. Okay, good. Cholic acid is another primary bile acid. Oh, I was at 0.2 in October. And now that's gone. Hey, doing good, right? Keno deoxycholic acids, another primary bile acid. Hey, that went down by two thirds from a 0.9 to a 0.3. Deoxycholic acids. This is another nasty one. A secondary bile acid. Hey, that went down by a third from 0 0.6 to 0 0.4. That's nice. And deoxycholic acids. Did I already just say that? I did say that. Sorry. Total bile acids. So they just total these up. They just add these up. 0.3 plus 0.4 equals 0.7. These added up give you 1.7. I'm down more than 50%. Pretty cool, right? What is that? I don't know. Is that like 60%? Something like that. I'm not doing the math in my head right now. Wow. So, so if I'm saying that subclinical cholestasis is related to disease, and here I am with these nice hormone numbers, and I'm showing proof of concept that my methods work in terms of lowering bile acids in the blood, oh, that's pretty good, right? I mean, I'm, I have, I only have a couple of clients who are willing, who, who are doing and willing to pay for the bile acids. I don't require it of people because it doesn't move my treatment forward. I do not need these numbers to treat anybody. Just like I don't have to have the vitamin A number to treat anybody. The approach works. The labs give us something to look at, but I don't need them. These certain labs. Oh, just so you know, the, the bold, the highlighted ones, the, the yellow highlight, those are the labs I actually run on normal, my clients, my individual testing and consultation package clients. So the only ones on here that I run on my clients, I've marked with the highlighter. There's only four, four labs. How many of you have gone to functional medicine doctors and had, had pages and pages and hundreds and hundreds or thousands of dollars of labs run and you didn't get any better at all? And I run four labs, four and a hair test to get people better. Most of these labs that you're looking at right here are symptoms. You could say they're signs because a, a lab is technically a sign. You know, there's signs and symptoms. You can say a, a lab is a sign because it's, you know, something that's measured. It's not something where somebody tells you I'm tired and they could be lying. They could be over-exaggerating. They could be under-exaggerating. But symptoms are described whereas signs are shown, but I'm going to call them symptoms because that's what people understand more because I'm trying to relate this. So, you know, so everybody can understand this. So labs, most labs are showing symptoms. Total testosterone. I consider it a symptom if it's low. Why? Because your hormones are built on so many other things. If somebody goes, I have low testosterone, then the first question should be why? And they go, Oh, uh, because, uh, I, I don't know. I don't exercise. Okay. Well, humans are supposed to exercise. So that's a root cause. So go exercise, go move your body. Like I don't eat enough protein. Well, 
you kind of have to eat enough protein to live. That's kind of a root cause. Go eat that. I don't, I don't have good zinc levels. Oh, there's a cause. Funny thing. You look at my old testosterone number and then 653, while not great by any means is better than most men out there at 30, 34. Why is that? I've been taking zinc a long time. You people listening to the copper pushers out there and you're wondering why you don't feel good and why you don't have good testosterone numbers. Stop taking that garbage. Stop taking the toxic metal called copper. Stop trying to emphasize copper in your diet. Stop taking vitamin A. Stop taking vitamin D supplements. You want to know what I'm doing to get these numbers? That's a big basis of it. And if it doesn't work, why is it working? Or if it shouldn't work, why is it working? Okay. Now we get to go into a very interesting section. Oh, and make sure you judge how well my brain is working on putting all these together. Because you may not like what I'm saying, but my brain's putting it together pretty good and it's working pretty good. So moving on, vitamin A. When was this? September 20th, September of 2020, April of 2021. I don't remember how to make that move down. Anyway, I was in the fifties. Fifties is fairly high for people who come to me and I had my issues. I had my prostate type urinary issues. I had my insomnia. I had my psoriasis. I had, I had my issues. I had my irritability. Oh boy. Which is a big sign of liver toxicity. So anyway, and this was still, geez, I'm, I'm almost four years in now. So this was what, two, a year and a half, a, a year ago, a year ago, a little more than that, a year and a half ago. And now I'm down to the 28 and the 32. Now, why people are going to be like, well, why did it go up? I'm going to say, because this happens what we're, with what we do on the program. This is just part of you watch it. There's a plateau here, 50 to 51. There's a plateau here, 28 to 32. That's still what I would consider a plateau. But I also started doing something that I will not discuss outside of my network that I think is amazing and has actually caused me to start getting rid of stuff faster, even though I'm fixing my cholestasis, less bile in my blood. But you see, even in the blood, you see these go up because I believe I'm getting rid of it faster. I think that's part of it. Either way, am I concerned? No, I feel amazing. Do I think this is going to go down very, very soon in the direction I expect it to? Yeah, absolutely. So retinol binding protein, retinol binding protein, people out there have been spewing some, some, what I believe is, is false information about retinol binding protein. Cause the people who think vitamin A is a vitamin, which I don't, they try to say that retinol binding protein is transporting vitamin A to where it's needed. No, it's protecting you from retinol because free retinol in the research is known to be extremely toxic. Free retinol that is not bound to something is very, very, very toxic. That's why your body makes retinol binding protein. That's why they can do the lab retinol binding protein and use it as a surrogate test for your serum retinol because they tend to stay together pretty well. What, how do they normally stay together? So I had a 3.9. I had, so look, I want you to look at this 50.7 and 4.9. What I've figured out from the research is that these will tend to be very close. If you take the RBP and you multiply it by 10, it should be, it should be at or above your vitamin A level. And then somebody might go, Oh, well, Dr. Smith, yours is not. And I'm like, right. I didn't feel as good back then as I do now. Oh, let's look at them now. 32.7, 3.9. Ooh, multiply this by 10, 39. Well above. I don't think I've ever seen an RBP relative to vitamin A this high. And I'm not bragging. I'm just out ahead of everybody else because I've been doing it longer. And I'm also the experimental guy. So new things that I think are going to work, like the, the new secret weapon that I've been doing that I believe is working very well is now showing proof of concept. So, you know, those who, uh, what, what's the term? Th those who take the risks reap the rewards kind of thing. I'm out there taking the risks. I don't give anything to my people before I try it out first. The new secret weapon that I'm talking about, I tried it six months on myself first. I think it works. So anyway, beta carotene, 17 and 19. I don't care. That'll come down. It's just, it's just riding the same, the same wave as the vitamin A. 
it's coming down. Those of you who are wondering, how could you not eat vitamin A for very much for four years and still have a normal vitamin A level? Oh, so again, I want these at all zero. I would love these. So, so you don't need RBP if you don't have retinol. I want all three of these to be zero, 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 zero. But these are the, these are, this is actually below 20 is deficiency. That's the first level to get to. Below 20, I want people below, I want people technically vitamin A deficient. That is what I, what I strive for. Oh, wait, let me, let me interject here. What I'm going over here today are my labs. And I'm going to talk about what I do for myself, for my labs. I am a doctor. I, if you are not working directly with me, I am not your doctor. If you are in the love your liver network, I am not, and you're not a client of mine, a direct client of mine. This is not advice for you to do. This is not medical advice. I am going over my labs and what has worked for me. And if you choose to take any information from this presentation and apply it to yourself, and then try to say, I told you to do something, I, I didn't. Some people might say, this is for entertainment purposes only, whatever. I'm testing. I also do a hair test with this. I'm not going over the hair test today because I simply don't have time. That takes a long time. And there is a lot to explain because when you see dumping detoxing on a hair test, it looks ugly. And I was having, I know that's why these went up. That's why my vitamin A went up. That's why my beta carotene went up. You go through detox cycles. If detox is real, imagine this, if detox is real and, and toxicity and processes of detoxification are in the literature. Any, any, any MD or anybody else who says detox is not real. I mean, seriously, have you never looked at the research? You should be embarrassed to say that it doesn't happen because there's very obvious studies. We can go and show toxicity and then show detox when they take away the thing that's poisoning them. How do you think the body gets you know, the fish or the mice or any of that stuff gets rid of it. It's called detox. My goodness. I mean, they call them detoxification pathways in the liver in medical books. And then, then they go through med school and then they're like, detoxification isn't real. And you're like, come on, man. So if detox is real, then it would show up in labs. Would it not? It's not some esoteric, like you can't see it happening kind of thing. You can see it on labs when it happens. You got to know how to recognize it. Soon enough, I'm working on trainings for practitioners so we can teach them how to watch this. Moving on. So my vitamin A went up a little bit. Oh no, how did it go up if I'm not eating it? How did it go up if I'm not eating it? Where could it have come from? maybe out of the storage in the liver. And so for people who are like, I mean, seriously, people, if you actually think that the liver doesn't store things, and then I've been minimizing or reducing vitamin A for almost four years, and you're like, you should be thinking, how in the heck does he still have vitamin A floating through his blood? Or then you start going, well, it must be coming out of your liver. And you go, well, how did you have four years worth of our vitamin A stored in your liver, Dr. Smith? Because we store things in our liver, silly head. Come on now. It may scare you practitioners and nutrition experts out there to realize that we store years worth of stuff in your liver and that your little weekend cleanses don't get rid of it. I'm going to take a bottle of milk thistle for a month and that's going to get rid of all the stuff in my liver. No, it doesn't. It actually milk thistle slows down your liver. It looks great short term. It's not good long term. I don't take any herbs for my liver. None. None. Vitamin D. Everybody's obsessing on vitamin D. Oh, mine's good. Oh, the protocol people out there say you need vitamin A to activate the vitamin D receptors and they need to link together and da -da -da. okay, okay, cool, cool. No, no. Vitamin A is an antagonist to vitamin D. Uh, you don't need vitamin A at all. How? Am I still having, oh my, but I did both storage vitamin D and active vitamin D. 
active vitamin D is right smack dab towards the middle of the range. How am I surviving with avoiding vitamin A for so long and avoiding copper? Because you need copper to, to activate all the bioavailable copper to activate all the stuff. No, 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 no. You are being sold a bunch of garbage by people who don't show you their labs, by people who seem to look like they're aging and getting less healthy very quickly. You're welcome to go check out my social media networks, to, you know, my social media pages to see how I'm doing. You can see on my YouTubes, you go and you look at the other videos from a couple of years ago, and I look a lot better now. It's not a coincidence. Proof of concept. Oh, here's the fun one. I know some people out there. So vitamin D, I'm fine. Vitamin C, Dr. Smith, your vitamin C is low. Oh, no. My bleeding, my gums are bleeding everywhere. Can you see them? My skin is falling apart. You know, there's a paper out there called Hypervitaminosis A and Scurvy, where in dogs, they looked at the symptoms of vitamin A toxicity in dogs who can't tell you different symptoms. They just have to look at them. And they looked at the symptoms of scurvy in dogs, and they were exactly the same symptom picture. I don't eat much in the way of fruit and vegetables. I do eat some, but I mean, I'm eating apples, which are not a high vitamin C food. I don't bleed when I brush my teeth. I don't bleed when I floss my teeth. I don't have scurvy in terms of those symptoms. I don't need to take vitamin K for sensitive teeth or bleeding gums or any of that stuff. You may know, you may want to watch my YouTube video on this channel about vitamin K deficiency being caused by vitamin A. And I have some articles in the advanced detox program on the network about vitamin C and scurvy and vitamin A toxicity. So I'm fixing vitamin A toxicity have been for you know, like close to four years, as I've said a couple of times now, and I have low vitamin C and I don't have any symptoms of it. Are we potentially going to poke a hole in the whole vitamin C thing here? Because the carnivores, the all muscle meat carnivores, they're not eating much vitamin C at all. And they'll try to make up stories about something hydroxybutyrate in the meat turns into something like vitamin C and does what vitamin C does. So that's why they don't need vitamin C. Or maybe it's just that an all muscle meat carnivore diet is a super low vitamin A diet. And then they don't need the vitamin C. That kind of lines up, doesn't it? Okay. I didn't run these extra iron labs this time because they don't change a dang thing I do. We come down to the ferritin. Again, some people are going to be like, oh my gosh, your ferritin went up. Oh my gosh. Ah. Well, you want to know what? I purposely did not do any blood draws in the last six months, seven months, because. I wanted to see what my ferritin would do from that 50. I'm, I'm a science experiment of one. We all are. And I wanted to see what would happen. And it went up a little bit. I want 30 to 70, went up to a 90. Pretty common, you know, it's, it's see my old numbers, 111 and 76. Then I went down to a 50. When my vitamin A was the lowest it's been, my vitamin A went up a bit. And my ferritin went up a bit. So for all of you protocolers out there who are obsessing over your ferritin and going in and getting blood draws when you don't even know your ferritin and potentially making yourselves anemic, all in this effort to sledgehammer down your ferritin kind of blindly, we can fix it. And if you go and you look in the research on vitamin A and iron, Vitamin A increases the absorption of iron in pretty much every study. So if you were obsessed with lowering iron overload, one of the things you probably shouldn't be eating is vitamin A through things like cod liver oil and liver and orange juice and sweet potatoes and all this stuff. You're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. But my ferritin went up a little bit. Like I said, 
I think I'm kind of dumping stuff faster and I'm feeling great right now. So I believe this is a temporary thing. And guess who's going to have another set of labs in about six months to go over to see what happens. That'll be me. Ask your favorite health guru if they're going to put up their labs. Next, the copper and zinc section. You copper pushers know I got a... Uh, don't like you. And all the copper pushers out there will say, don't take copper antagonists. Copper antagonists will lower your bioavailable copper. And uh, the, you have to take copper with your zinc to balance them out. And dirt No, 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 no. You just need to not take an obscene amount of zinc without any guidance in testing. Pretty simple. I've been taking zinc. I was probably taking zinc back in 2012 back when my testosterone was where it was. I've been taking zinc a long time. Shouldn't I have copper deficiency? I take right now, again, this is not medical advice to you listening. I'm going to tell you how much zinc I've been taking for a, going on at least a year now. I've been taking 60 milligrams a day and some of you protocol people or copper revolution people may be like, <laughs> as I sit here and chuckle. And my copper is still very in the very normal range. Now I, that 75 to 90 is my range. That is my range. I have gone tighter than the William Walsh range. I don't want to see anybody above a 90 in copper. And if somebody gets their copper low and they earn it through doing what we do and their health is doing amazing, and they get low copper, I don't care. If somebody comes to me, they're very sick and they have low copper, they have liver problems. So there's two distinct groups. There's people who are sick who have low copper and they have significant liver problems. And then there's people with low copper who have earned it through antagonizing copper and avoiding vitamin A because Copper toxicity and vitamin A toxicity problems always come together. Funny that other people are giving those things together a lot. Funny that birth control pills, which are known to be horrible, horrible things for women, have been shown to raise both of those things in the blood since 1975. I have a whole video about birth control pills on this channel you could go watch. Presenting all that evidence over and over and over again. And copper IUDs, a copper wire put into women's cervixes makes them infertile. Oh, here, I, wait, I just want you to, here I am showing testosterone numbers that are really good, a sign of potential fertility being good. And I'm saying zinc is your friend. And then you have the other copper pushers out there. When there's a copper IUD and birth control pills have consistently been shown to raise copper in the blood, used to induce infertility. And I have a whole video on this, this channel too, about how vitamin A induces fertility and, and uh, pregnancy problems, fertility, contraception, delivery, all of it. Pick your fighter, choose your fighter. So then we have zinc. I want zinc 100 to 135. I believe this is the, re the, the, ra the, the range I got from Walsh. What I do is I skip zinc the day of the test. I skip zinc the, day, the whole day before the test. One of the reasons I had to wait on this test was because I messed up a couple of times and I took my zinc the day before the test. And then I said, ah, dang it, I can't do the test. So that's one reason why I went beyond the six months was because I, on the days I had planned to do it, I messed up. Doctors mess up too. Labs can mess up too. So anyway, my zinc's doing quite well. Thank you. My hair zinc was doing quite well too. I take zinc every day and I do eat a fair amount of red meat. So I should be getting plenty of zinc. And yet my copper is still completely in the normal range. Been doing this for years. You have tons of copper in your liver. Do not let anyone tell you, you need more copper.
I don't use copper with a single person. So now let's go into the thyroid section for all of you uh, pro-metabolic people out there and uh, all the thyroid obsessed people. And honestly, I, I, if some of you are going to throw out that you have optimal ranges, uh, different than where my ranges are in, that's cool. That's cool. Y'all can keep taking your thyroid hormone and taking your mega dose Lugol's iodine and just completely destroying your thyroids. While well, all I take for my thyroid is some selenium each day. That's it. People will say my diet is too low in iodine. If it is, it's not showing up here. It's not showing up in symptoms. TSH 3.2. It's a little higher than I was taught in my functional medicine class that we want to have, but I can also show you in the vitamin A toxicity affecting thyroid research that vitamin A toxicity severely throws TSH way up and way down, throws it all around the place. Some people go really high. Some people go really low. And this can even happen while there's normal thyroid hormone numbers. I don't normally run thyroid hormones because you can tell by people's symptoms generally how things are going. You don't have to run these tests all the time. But if you want to run them, you go ahead. Don't let me talk you out of it. Just know that this is showing symptoms of a sick thyroid. It's not showing why. Free T3. Well, that's pretty close to the middle of the range. Total T3. Mid-range. Free T4 on the high end of, of higher than the midpoint of the range. Total T4, about mid-range-ish. Okay, and some of you are going to go, well, that's low normal because you're below the midpoint. I don't care. I feel good. Ask yourself this question. How's modern medicine doing on fixing thyroid problems? How's your alternative medicine doctor doing on fixing thyroid problems? Are they getting you off of thyroid hormone? Or are they just messing around with your dose? Are they getting you off of thyroid hormone gradually? Or are they just messing around with your dose? Because if they're not getting you, if you're not seeing a steady move towards less thyroid symptoms and less thyroid medication, they're just like jerking you around. They're just medicating you. Okay, we're not trying to do that. No, I'm not saying I can get everybody off of thyroid hormones, not by, not by any stretch. But we do regularly have people lowering their thyroid hormones, especially the people who are working with me. So you can have whatever opinion you want of my thyroid numbers. I, we're going to go through the CBC. I don't have a ton of time to go through this stuff, so I'm just going to hit the ones that are off, okay? Red blood cells, slightly on the high side. We've had this for a while. I'm still here. Possible reasons for this. We have dehydration at the time of blood draw, which is a very common cause. It can draw, it, the, the, uh, slight dehydration at the time of the blood draw can drive up a ton of blood numbers, okay? The other thing is erythrocytosis or polycythemia. This means you have, it's a condition of having too many red blood cells in your blood. That's all it means. Poly, many, scythe is um, cells, emia is in the blood, okay? Cyto is cell, right? Erythro is like the red blood cells and cytosis is an increase in number. So these are the same, these, these basically mean the same thing. Well, you've seen, I've had this for a while. When was it the highest? Oh, I didn't do one when I was on TRT. Anyway, am I worried about this? It's going down. Huh, it's going down. Do you know one thing that can cause erythrocytosis or polycythemia is vitamin A toxicity. Oh, I've been working for four years getting rid of my vitamin A toxicity, and this is slowly going down. I've seen this in a bunch of people who have come to me with vitamin A toxicity. And do we see it go down over time? Yes. So am I freaking out about this? No. Now, the other thing that guys on testosterone will have is they'll have too many red blood cells. It's common. They have to go give blood to get their red blood cells down because it could cause them to have a heart attack. It will keep going up and up and up if they don't do it and go donate blood. Well, I've been on testosterone before. And I think I did have to go donate blood to get that back down. Well, so now I've got high testosterone, right? 
eight, nine, three and a half up there. And yet my red blood cells are still going down because I'm not on a drug. Pretty cool, right? Monocyte percentage. So there's absolute monocytes down here. This one, absolute monocytes are just fine in the middle of the range. Monocytes as a percent of the whole are slightly high. And I've had this for a little while. Okay. Okay. What are the possible reasons? Well, one of the reasons I was given in one of my functional medicine classes was inflammation, which means Jack F all to me. It, it, the word inflammation means nothing. If you don't, people are like, well, my disease is from inflammation, or I have too much inflammation in my body. You're really not saying anything. Do you understand? Like you've learned this term from practitioners who don't know what's going on in the body. And they give you this term, well, it's all inflammation. Like all diseases linked to inflammation. That doesn't move medicine forward at all. It just, it's like a distraction. It's like the media does with distractions. They're like, oh, let's turn chronic illness into inflammation. And then, so I, I like to do this with people when they say, my diseases, my problems are all from inflammation and I need to take turmeric or whatever, which doesn't help anything um, to, to anti-inflame it, right? Well, why don't you just take an anti-inflammatory, like an NSAID, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug? Shouldn't that cure all disease if all disease is linked to inflammation? I mean, shouldn't it be that simple? Isn't inflammation just kind of like a global concept? Why can't you just shut it down? Do you want to shut down inflammation? They'll say, oh, you don't want to shut down inflammation too much because you need some in your body. And I go, so who's running the show? Should we try to run it from the outside? Or should we try to figure out what's causing the inflammation inside, which could be unresolved toxicities, as we say down here. And also when you don't have the right amounts of specific minerals in the body, you will tend to show more inflammation. If you have a lot of calcium in your system and you don't have enough magnesium for it, guess what that shows up as? Joint pain, stiffness, cracking, popping, low thyroid symptoms, blood sugar stability problems. And that's just not enough magnesium relative to your calcium. They could both be low, but if you don't have enough magnesium relative to your calcium, you can get the same high calcium symptoms. So anyway, there's that eosinophils as a percentage, little bit high. I mean, I, I, I'm you're, I want less than 3%. So it's at 3% allergies of any kind. Okay. Let me tell you, we all have our weak spots in our system. One of my weak spots as I grab a Kleenex is I tend to be one of those kind of slightly allergic types. Okay. It's so much better. Like this season when all the pollen fell. In, in Tucson, Arizona, those of you who know, like there's a time of year when all the trees around here turn yellow and there's yellow pollen everywhere. There's piles of pollen in the corners of parking lots, just piles of yellow pollen collecting everywhere. So one sec. Perfect timing. Perfect timing for that. Anyway, so I'm kind of one of those. My dad was very, uh, had tons of seasonal allergies. My dad had them. I have them. My son has them. Now, my son, I can't, I, you know, I only have him 50% of the time these days and trying to get him to eat a good diet has been, eh, you know, we're working on it. He's learning how to cook with me. And so he's going to learn how to cook a lot of the good stuff, but my son has allergic type stuff too. So that's kind of like you, when you think of genetics, like this is the stuff that can be handed down. You can be handed down a weakness, kind of like a, you're going to be, if you mess up in this area, you're going to be weaker to that. Everybody has this. Genetics are very real. Can you get around it? Yes, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Well, the environment is what you put into your body or don't too. So like I said, I just went through another allergy season and I was 90% I was better than I've been in the past. Okay, am I still kind of a little bit of an allergic person? As an example, there at one point in my marriage, my ex-wife said to me, you've had like a runny nose kind of like a runny nose ever since I met you. And I was, oh, really? I didn't quite realize it was that bad because I'd gotten used to it. So I know I'm just kind of like, that's one of my things. So seeing this little number, oh no, I'm, I'm on the verge. Oh no, I'm going to freak out. No, let's move on. I'm done with these. These are all green. Creatinine, 
slightly high. Oh my gosh, it's going up, Dr. Smith. I kind of went outside of that range just a tiny bit. Again, poorly hydrated at the blood draw time could be it, which could play into the red blood cells too. A high protein diet can play into a high creatinine. You can look it up. Well, recently, I finally admitted to myself that I do better on a more meat diet. Now, that doesn't mean I'm carnivore by any means. But it means I realized that, you know what? I feel better when more of my diet is meat. So guess what I did? What if you say, so the opposite of doc, it hurts when I do this would be doc. It feels good when I do this. Well, then do more of that. Okay, so I feel better when I eat more meat. So I've shifted my diet up in red meat. Okay. Creatinine went up a little bit. Now, another thing in my history that I've talked about commonly is that one of the things when I was really detoxing hard and probably putting more toxic bile into my blood because I was dumping so much bile that, that whatever leaked, I was leaking more into my blood. It goes to your kidneys. I used to get a lot of flank stiffness. So it's like lower back, but more to the outside. You know, like when you get up in the morning and you're like, you're really stiff and you're like, oh, 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 you get out of the car after sitting in there a long time and everything's really stiff. I used to have that in my, my lower back, my flanks in the morning. I don't get that anymore. But I used to. So I, I attributed that to kidney, like referred pain from the kidneys. Referred stiffness from the kidneys. And so am I worried about this? No. I mean, I did, I did increase my protein. And I have a little bit of a history of the kidneys. So, but it, am I going to go and freak out because I'm 0 0.03 above this end range? No, I'm not. So nothing else is orange in this row. We come down here to cholesterol. Okay, so I was down at 198. Like I said, I do think I'm dumping a lot more toxins right now, and that's why some of these things went up. So I went up to a 223. I believe that's going to come down. Then we come down to VLDL went up a tiny bit, but look at how much my HDL went up, 56 to a 65. Triglycerides are still low. For those of you who know the carnivore out there, named Paul Saladino, who's got triglycerides, like, what were they something? 500? Do I remember somebody saying 700? Something crazy. Yeah, triglycerides are a marker of vitamin A toxicity. I have a whole article about this in my research forum. Like, it's very obvious. They start giving people vitamin A and their triglycerides go up. And he was eating liver and selling liver and all that stuff. So anyway, I'm not surprised. But you see, I'm a lot lower than when I started here and then down LDL started here still lower than when I started went back up. So if I was dumping more vitamin A out of my liver and more of it was getting bound to cholesterol, you're going to learn something interesting about cholesterol right now. We might see cholesterol go up a little bit, especially the bad ones, the LDLs and the VLDLs. So possible reason here. I put increased vitamin A as an increased serum retinol because my serum retinol didn't go up. Okay. Increased what I call detox dumping. Well, that's why I think the increased vitamin A was in the blood. Now I put this link here, C section two, three, two on VLDL here. So here's the link. You're welcome to type it out here. Let me open it up for you. Wait, let me go into the I got to go into this. I'll give you the name of it so you can search easier. Hepatic metabolism of retinoids and disease associations. Why would they associate vitamin A with disease? Can you believe they're doing this? Can you, the nerve of them to associate vitamin A with diseases? This is, this is a travesty of justice, of nutrition. Don't talk bad about my vitamin A now. He's a good boy. Okay. We're going to go over this little quote that I took out of that paper. So you all can start to understand that cholesterol may actually be a protective mechanism against vitamin A toxicity. And that's why as you become more toxic in vitamin A, you see your cholesterol go up. You didn't know there was vitamin A in cholesterol now, did you? You're going to know now. So let's go. Here's the quote from that link. 
In the fasting circulation, over 95% of retinoid is present as retinol bound to retinol binding protein, i.e. as retinol dash RBP. Okay. Remember how I told you that the body does this to protect you. So continuing the remainder, the other 5% is found as retinyl ester in lipoproteins of hepatic liver origin, very low density lipoprotein VLDL and low density lipoprotein LDL. Did you catch the lipoprotein? The remainder of your vitamin A is found as retinyl esters. That's vitamin A bound to a fatty acid ester bound to VLDL and LDL. And they say here, thus VLDL and LDL normally represent a minor alternative retinoid delivery pathway for retinoid delivery from the liver to the extra hepatic tissues. Well, I disagree, but believe what you will. However, this pathway may compensate partially for the loss of retinol binding protein. Hmm. Cholesterol compensating for the loss of retinol binding protein. People aren't making enough retinol binding protein and the body starts making cholesterols to bind to it, to protect you from the vitamin A. Does this make sense? Your body desperately will try to bind vitamin A to things because free retinol is super duper toxic. So it has multiple pathways to protect you from it, not to deliver it, to protect you. It is well established. It is, wait, keywords here. It is well established that retinyl esters are associated with VLDL and LDL, the bad ones in the fasting circulation of healthy humans, as well as mice. In humans, approximately 70% of circulating retinyl esters is associated with the VLDL fraction and the remainder with the LDL fraction. It is not presently understood how retinyl esters come to be present in the VLDL and LDL fractions. So they're saying they don't know jack squat about it. Oh, but, but we deliver vitamin A to tissues with the retinoid binding pro retinol binding protein and, and cholesterol and stuff. Oh yeah. Right. We've got to make it sound good. They've got to make it sound good. Apologetics everywhere. It is possible in humans that some of the retinal ester in VLDL and LDL comes to be present there through the actions of cholesterol, cholesterol ester transfer protein, CETP, which is known to be able to transfer retinal ester between triglyceride rich, tri there they are again, triglyceride rich chylomicrons and other lipoprotein fractions. Alternatively, hepatocytes, liver cells may package and secrete some retinal ester in nascent VLDL. The relative importance of each of these two processes in humans has not been established. Maybe it hasn't been established because they keep trying to make it into a good thing when it's really not a good thing. So they mentioned specifically triglyceride rich chylomicrons, and they mentioned VLDL and LDL. Now, modern medicine seems to think that these things are bad. Too much of them is definitely not a good sign. And they just so happen to be associated with vitamin A. What a weird coincidence. So weird. Weird that they would find, you know, heart disease connected to these things. Huh. <laughs> so, hope you learned something there. I fully expect all of my numbers that are higher than they were last time on this test to be back into the lower, the normal ranges and get back into the place that they're supposed to be and be better than they were before. I think this is just a, a little detox bump in the road for some of these. But again, I want you to look, go back and look at my, I'll put the link to this, this chart in the notes below this video. Proof of concept right here. We are fixing cholestasis. Every client I've had come back to me who has tested their bile acids twice 
baseline follow-up, we have lowered these numbers. And they feel better. Toxic bile in your blood is at the root of your health problems. These numbers, if you go and look at these numbers and you, let's say you looked at your numbers and you're like, my numbers are better than yours, Dr. Smith but I have a lot more health problems. The reason I stopped testing these is because they don't directly correlate to your symptom severity, your number of symptoms, your severity of symptoms. It doesn't, it doesn't correlate directly. And I don't treat you based on these numbers. We just take the numbers and we say, we want to improve them. And we do a bunch of general things in, in the program. And then we can do the specific things in terms of the nutrients, the minerals that I work with people on testing, not guessing via hair and blood tests. So we can then address that's what we, that's the specific stuff we do. And then people also get specific help when they go to my office hours, which is part of their testing and consultation package. Okay. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that. I got a lot of compliments and thank yous for my last labs video. I'm out here, not afraid. I lead from the front. I'm out, out here, not afraid to go over a ton of labs. I think these labs cost me $700 at doctor's prices. So this is not like something I take lightly. And you need to make sure to ask your health experts, your gurus to go and do something like this and show proof of concept that what they're doing is working. And then make sure you know what drugs they're on and what hormones they're on. So when they're cheating on their test to make it look a certain way, you know. Okay, so again, I'm Dr. Garrett Smith, the nutrition detective of nutritiondetective.com. Um, there is the Love Your Liver program at members.nutritiondetective.com. Um, hope you all come and see us someday. If you got questions about stuff, you know, you can email Julie admin at nutritiondetective.com and she can set you up, you know, with an appointment and you can get logistics handled, scheduling handled and all that stuff. We're still a little bit of an old school kind of office and uh, that's the way we like it. So anyway, hope you learned something. Hope you uh, see that this is working and I will see you next time. Bye now.